Thank you for clicking on my video. As you can see on the screen, if you watch this video, you'll see how vitamin D can help you. Find out how it works in your body and have some things to talk about with your healthcare professional and find out what I do with vitamin D. Now, it's very important to note that I am not medically qualified. I have a degree in physics but not medicine. I have been a member of parliament and you may ask what's a politician or ex-politician doing talking about vitamins. I am in fact a tech entrepreneur and a musician, which doesn't qualify me to give any, le any advice on medicine. And I'm not a doctor and this is not a medical advice. Um, but I have been studying various issues to do with not just vitamin D but other things to improve cellular health. Because if your cellular health is better, then your own health is better. And I'm actually somebody, being as I'm now in my 60s, I've had a few issues with sleep. and. I think I've learned some useful things and one way of sharing them is to put out a YouTube video. I'm not intending to do a lot of these, although if people find them useful I might do a small number of them. It's not monetized, and I'm not sponsored. So uh, what I suggest you do if you find the information helpful that you discuss the information in this video with your healthcare professional to work out what to do. Now vitamin D is essential for good health. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And there's um, a very good report by a panel which looked at um, vitamin D, which said the panel concludes the cause and effect relationship has been established between the dietary intake of vitamin D and contribution to the normal function of the immune system and healthy inflammatory response and maintenance of a normal muscle function. I've put the link here and in fact at the end of the video I've got all the links and I will put them in the comments as well so you can read them. And uh, another one, vitamin D receptor is expressed in most human tissues and has more than a thousand target genes. So if we, if we look at this particular thing here, which looks at vitamin D3, um, and we can see that there are a thousand genes that respond to vitamin D. So there are things that won't happen if you don't have vitamin D. Um, now, I think people know more generally that vitamin D can be created from exposing the skin to ultraviolet light. Um, and you can use an ultraviolet lamp to achieve the same thing if it's the right wavelength. Uh, but if you're in a country away from the equator, you're unlikely that you're going to get enough vitamin D. And particularly during the winter, but also potentially during the summer. So people with darker skins also generate less vitamin D, so they need to take more vitamin D often. And that's because the UV is absorbed in the skin by the melanin. And you, vitamin D doses are measured in international units, IU, and IU is 40 micrograms of vitamin D. Now, there is a factoid that people often get wrong about vitamin D, and the, the wrong factoid is that, that you can't take too much. In fact, you can take too much vitamin D. And actually, as with many supplements, it's best to tell your healthcare professional if you're taking it so that they can take that into account. But it is difficult to take too much and ha as a consequence, um, there, there tends to be more of an issue if people have kidney disease, and I'll explain why that is in a little bit. And if you, if you look on the internet, you can find cases, here's one, I guess good could be dangerous, where you have uh, hypercalcemia due to hypervitaminosis D, well hyper meaning more of, over. So you have too much calcium because you've got too much vitamin D, um, but that does some people are more susceptible to this than others, and it's an issue to discuss with a healthcare professional. But here we have a case of 15 patients, most of whom were elderly, um, who got over uh, too much calcium because they took too much vitamin D. So it's not something just to, to ignore. And the people who say you can't take too much, actually, that's wrong. Um, but what you need to understand if you want to really get into um, how vitamin D operates, and we'll ignore vitamin D2. Vitamin D3 is the one that's generated by human beings. And it starts either, um, whether it's taken by a supplement or obtained from ultraviolet sunlight, as what's called cholecalcerol, which is has 27 carbons, 44 hydrogen, and an oxygen. And that then is converted by the liver to calcesividol, which is, again, 27 carbons, 44 hydrogens and two oxygens. And it's, it's often known as 25 OHD because it's um, hydroxid form. It's ad added, um, a added a, a, an OH to it, basically. And this stays in your body until the kidneys need to convert it. And the important point 
is that actually that the kidneys can convert it to two different things. One is the hormone, but also if there's enough um, calcitriol, well, cal calcifeodol, and there's enough vitamin D around, it will actually create this thing, 24-25-dihydroxyvitamin, which is also a um, 27-carbon thing, uh, but, but it actually has the hydrogen and oxygen in a slightly different place. Uh, and we, the, on PubMed, the, there's some very useful pages which explain about the different chemicals, um, colicals or different molecules, uh, calcifeidol, diol, um, calcitriol, which is the normal hormone, and what I would call the fourth molecule. And the important thing about this is there is a fourth molecule that can be created from vitamin D. And that one is, if it comes up, here we go, 24-25-dihydroxyvitamin D. Um, now, in fact, we can see what these things look like. And here we have an example of vitamin D. And vitamin D has this sort of oxygen over here. Uh, can I get it to point at oxygen somehow or other? Yes, that's, that's an oxygen there. So you see all these carbon um, connected to hydrogen um, atoms. And then we have um, the, the oxygen. We can actually move it around a little bit, which is quite clever. Um, but that, that, that's vitamin D. Now, this is the first metabolite, 25-OHD. And as you can see, it's got its two oxygens with a, with a hydrogen, two hydroxy groups on the end of it, which makes it different to vitamin D. And this is the active form, what's known sometimes as the hormone, uh, calcitriol. And that has um, three, as you can see, three OH attached to carbons rather than just H attached to carbon. But if there is enough 25 OHD, we then get this one, which is the 24-25 uh, one. As you can see, the OHs are actually in a, a slightly different place as in compared to um, calcitriol. Uh, and that, that makes all the difference. Obviously, it's a different molecule. It does different things. We then have a debate about how much vitamin T people should take. And uh, ignoring that from the sun for the moment, um, there are the UK government says it should be 4, 400 IU a day. The German government say 800 IU a day. And there's a wide range of other views. And we also need to consider the fourth molecule, this 2425 molecule. And there are differing views as to what the impact of that particular molecule is. So if we look it up on Wikipedia, for instance, and I wouldn't say Wikipedia is necessarily the font of all wisdom, but it's very good as a source, we see that um, it says that perhaps it's just there to get rid of vitamin D. Alternatively, it's not known whether it has any physiologically significant, significant activity. Um, and then we move on to... Um, what, what it says actually on the Human Metabolome Database, which is another useful source of information about various um, molecules that, that you may or may not have inside your body. Um, and over here, we have it says, through the past decades, data have accumulated that this particular fourth molecule is not merely a degradation product, but also has effects on its own. And this is... Um, one of the interesting things about developing science, particularly to do with um, such things as supplements, etc., that as science moves on, we learn more things and we have to relearn things that we didn't know previously. And uh, one of the most important things, for instance, is how much vitamin D should you have? And obviously, if it's clear that this particular uh, molecule has effects and to get this molecule created in your body, you should take more vitamin D, then there's an argument for more vitamin D. But then there is also the point that if you take too much vitamin D, that can be harmful. So we've got to try to get the balance right. And that's where all the challenge lies. Um, so if we assume we want the fourth molecule and there are key issues. Firstly, we know that the vitamin D is converted to 25 OHD, but it's not going to do it immediately. It's going to take a period of time. It may convert more if there's more vitamin D around and less if there's less around, or it may convert it as a, a standard rate. How much 25 OHD do you need to make sure there's enough of the fourth molecule? And that's another thing. And what effect is there of having unconverted vitamin D in circulation? Now, I've done a lot of reading around on various things like PubMed, etc. 
and I couldn't really find a good answer on this so I did decided to do some experimentation and the only person I can experiment on really is myself so uh, that it has problems because obviously when you're experimenting taking things yourself and seeing what happens um, you're you're creating an experiment to bias so you, you don't know it's that reliable but it gives some idea and it, it gave some information which I think it's it's useful to share so if you're going to do research you've got to take measurements and record it and I, I actually measured things with sleep and although I started taking vitamin D to get rid of psoriasis which it did I found it also helped with sleep so I used a Fitbit to record how well I slept now the, the medics don't like Fitbits, they say they're not very reliable, and to some extent that's true. There are polysomnographs which are much more reliable, but they're more invasive generally, and you have to go to a sleep laboratory, and actually you can use a Fitbit every night or during the day, and you can keep notes on your mobile phone, which is quite a good way of doing things. And what I started doing was taking 3,000 IU a day and then stopping to see what happened. And I made other, maintained other parameters constant by not varying too much what I ate, and um, also keeping other supplements constant because if you change lots of different things you don't know what the impact is and what I found was that actually when I stopped taking vitamin D initially my sleep would improve but then after a few days as, as it ran down uh, the 25OD ran down of course it deteriorated then I tried uh, a more interesting experiment taking a larger quantity of vitamin D and it was quite clear that vitamin D I can convert almost 3000 IU a day um, in a day and then if, if I took like 24,000 it would disrupt sleep for about three nights and then you'd have better sleep for a while and then after a period of time you'd, you'd start aching a bit and your sleep would deteriorate I take that as indicating either an optimal level of 25 OHD for calcitriol or indeed an optimal level of 25 OHD for um, producing the fourth molecule the 24 25 one um, uh, and that that's actually useful information um, and I think from my point of view it gives me a working hypothesis now one of the other issues about vitamin D is actually the the more fat you've got the more vitamin D you need now I, during the process of doing this experimentation I've lost a lot of weight um, which almost certainly reduced the need for vitamin D but I'm doing lots of other experimentation which I may report on if people find it interesting um, but it does also show that vitamin D, if you want to take it, should take in the morning because then your body's got more time to process it. And so by the time you go to bed, it's, it's converted mainly to, or we don't know what proportion, to 25 OHD. Obviously, it's possible to measure these things because you can sample the blood and see what the levels of 25 OHD were. But this will vary from person to person because people, different people have different needs. Um, and it can't say that my figure of 3,000 is reliable for anyone else but it does indicate that the government's 400 is pretty useless and even for the German proposal of 800 IU is pretty useless as well um, but I would suggest that it's it's something you could look at with your healthcare professional and see whether they think it's worth just trying to do some re keep some records of what impact it has on you and, and experiment with various levels uh, but it is important that that's done with a healthcare professional advising uh, and remembering as an ex-politician, musician, tech entrepreneur, I'm not the person to give medical advice, but I thought this would be some useful information. If you think it's useful and people say, yes, it's useful, please do another video on something else, then I will do so. And if people don't find it useful, then I won't do any more. Quite happy with that? No problem.